Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and welcome everybody. <laughs> this is Bible Alive Rise as we delve into God's word. Oh my, oh my, it's just been such an honor and just a privilege uh, to be able to be with you each week as we uh, look at God's word, as we fellowship together. Uh, such a tremendous blessing. Uh, so we are going to uh, get started and uh, jump right in after we pray. And we are going to go into our leadership lesson for tonight. Our Father, we bless your name on tonight, God. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory that you are so deserving of. Father, we are thankful and grateful that you have given us this precious book called the Bible. Um, it is your very word. It is the very essence of who you are. And you have revealed yourself to us. You have revealed to us how we are to live, the things we are to do, things we are not to do, how we are to grow as leaders to be able to do the things you have called us to do. So we thank you. We praise you. Be with us now as we uh, study this lesson in Jesus precious name. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. All right. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing in our series as we are looking at leadership and we are looking at leadership from the perspective of um, leadership needed to grow the church and the individual because the church is comprised of individuals okay so as the individual grows so does the church grow and um, we've been just to remind us um, of the definition of leadership, the action of leading a group of people or an organization such as the church. And um, from Maxwell, John Maxwell, um, he declares that leadership is influence. And the more influence you have, that means the more effective you are able to be. And why is leadership important? Well, it is important to move us from where we are to where God has destined for us to be. And so God always places leaders um, uh, to, to, to lead, uh, to help, to guide in the way in which he wants us to go. And so leadership needed to grow the church, to grow the individual. And then we had a look at these five levels of leadership, uh, the first and lowest position, the um, uh, level, the position level, which is based on your title, the permission level, which is relationship based, the production level, which is result based. And then we have the last two levels, the people development level. And that is empowerment based. And that's where we are really wanting to, to get to where uh, people follow you because you are invested in them and have helped them to become leaders themselves. Okay, so it's discipleship making, but on the level of leadership. And then the pinnacle level, legacy based, meaning that people follow you because you have already developed a reputation for developing strong leaders. And so they look to you as someone with expertise that's able to help them to get to the place where they want to be as well. And so we had been looking at a few examples and really just trying to glean some uh, knowledge and understanding about leadership and how we can apply it to our lives as we look at the lives of other leaders in the scripture. And we had looked at um, Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. And a couple of the things that we were able to pull from there is humility. 
humility when we look at their leadership. Um, initially, Paul was under Barnabas's authority because he was his assistant while they were in Antioch of Syria. But then a year, just a short year after being with um, Barnabas as his assistant, the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas um, to go out on their first missionary journey. And now Paul is the leader and Barnabas has to submit to his authority as an apostle. And guess what? He does it. No fuss, no muss. So listen, if you are going to be a good leader, you must also be a good follower. There's always going to be someone above you. If you can't follow that person that's above you, why would you expect those under you to follow you? So humility is necessary in leadership. And then we saw this quality here of inflexibility where Paul refused to take John Mark, a division, there was a, a sharp split and we then see the compassion of Barnabas giving John Mark another chance. So this is what we've just been talking about, this discipleship, uh, this empowerment-based level where uh, Barnabas is discipling and developing John Mark, giving him another chance and then helping him, showing him, teaching him along the way. And so the result is that a new leader was developed. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So much so that at the end of Paul's life, he was able to say, bring John Mark with you for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Of course, that probably likely didn't happen because Second Timothy, we know, is Paul's swan song, and he had written it just shortly before he was actually beheaded. So more than likely, that may not have happened. But the point is that he acknowledged that this same guy who he refused to give a second chance, who he would not take with him on his second missionary journey, was now um, useful and helpful to him in the ministry. And why is it? Because of Barnabas. So what we see as a leader is that discipleship is difficult. Nurturing people is difficult, but it is necessary in order to grow leaders. And then... Oh, and before we leave um, John Mark, uh, we also mention and know that John Mark is the same one who wrote the gospel according to Mark. So Barnabas never wrote um, any scripture, but he nurtured and developed John Mark so that John Mark was able to write that gospel. And then we looked last time at Priscilla, Aquila, and Apollos. And what we noted is that Apollos, he was a, a student of the word. He studied the word and he was taught the word. So he was willing to submit, to come under and he learned it and he learned the word well. And then he eloquently proclaimed the word. So what we see here in Apollos is that he is being an example, a good example how to come under, and then once he has gained um, knowledge and expertise, then he is able to do what he has been taught. But understand, before he started teaching, he studied, he did what the word of God said, so that when he is teaching the word, he is authentic and not able to be accused of being a hypocrite. That's what a good leader must be, a good example. And then we have Priscilla and Aquila, this husband and wife team who heard him speak, heard Apollo speak, recognized the gift and they recognize where he was excelling, but then they also recognize where he needed a little tweaking and a little help. 
All right. So you have to have wisdom, knowledge and understanding. That's what is also required in a leader. So as leaders, they were wise. They took him aside, probably took him home for Sunday lunch and um, instructed him more uh, precisely in the word of God. So a leader must be wise must have the wisdom of God and have the knowledge and understanding of the word and be able to deal with people and help to build other leaders. And we know that Apollos became a great leader in the early church because he was on the level of the apostles. So Paul was saying that some of the Corinthians says, I follow Paul. Others say, I follow Apollos or I follow Peter. Paul and Peter are ap apostles. Apollos is not an apostle, but because of the gifting and because of the, 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 the knowledge and his ability to handle the word, he is now in this company of the apostles. All right. And so Priscilla and Aquila were helpful and instrumental in helping Apollos to become all that God had ordained for him to become. All right. And so tonight we want to look at a different example. And now we are going to go to the Old Testament. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, we are going to the Old Testament and we want to take a look at Samuel and Saul. And of course, we know that Saul was the first king of Israel. He was actually anointed by Samuel. And Samuel, he was, uh, he had three leadership roles. He was an, he was a prophet. He was a priest and he was a judge. In fact, he was the last judge of Israel. And judges in those days were actually military uh, leaders so that if the um, nation needed to go out to war, then the judge would be the one that would lead them. But the judge would lead them under the authority of, of God, who was Israel's king. But then the people decided they didn't want that. They wanted a king just like every other nation. And so um, God said, okay, you want a king? You're going to, I'll give you a king. If that's what you want. But sometimes when you get what you want, you don't quite want what you've got. And such was the case here with this first King Saul. And so we come to this 15th chapter of Samuel. And this is the situation that we have here. So um, as we read um, this uh, particular passage, we want to look at the leadership role that each person played, um, Samuel as well as Saul, and how did they handle their role, whether appropriately or inappropriately? All right, so let's take a look at the text, beginning at verse 3. Samuel said to Saul, go and completely destroy the Amalekite nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels and donkeys. Now, let me pause right there, okay? Because when we read things like this in the scriptures, it just seems contrary to who God is, to the character of God. You know, God being a loving God, a forgiving God and so forth. And yet here he is telling Saul through the prophet Samuel to destroy the entire Amalekite nation, not just the people, even the babies and down to all of the animals destroy everything totally. Why would God say that? Well, the Amalekites, we need to know who the Amalekites are. Um, Amalek, the Amalekites are descendants of Amalek. 
And Amalek was the grandson of Esau. Okay, remember Jacob and Esau were twin brothers. Jacob's name was later changed to Israel. So, so you have the Israelites and Esau's descendants are called Edomites. So the Israelites and the Edomites, though they were always constantly at war with each other, because remember how Jacob stole Esau's birthright. And, um, and so there was always this contention between them. All right. And so Amalek is the grandson of Esau. And Amalek, if you recall, when Israel came out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, the Amalekites were the first ones to wage war against the Israelites. And that's when Moses had to sit on, on the rock on the top of the hill and hold up his staff and Aaron and her held up his hands so that uh, his hands could remain steady so that Israel would be able to prevail against the Amalekites. And so what God had determined is because their cousins were so, um, had treated Israel so badly, so terribly. And of course, because of their own wickedness as well, they were idol worshipers and wicked as well. And because of that, God had said that this would be the punishment on the Amalekites that they would be wiped out. And so God was going to now use Saul as his instrument to carry out the punishment that he had dictated uh, the Amalekites would suffer. And then verse seven, it says, Saul slaughtered the Amalekites, but, but, but he spared King Agag and kept the best of the sheep and cattle, kept them. Then Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him, Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up, look at this, to set up a monument to himself. What does that tell you? All right, we're going to discuss all of that. Okay, then he went to Gilgal. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. I have carried out the Lord's commands. But Samuel wasn't buying it. He says, then what is all the bleating of sheep I hear? It's true, Saul says, that the army spared, the army spared the best of the sheep, but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God, we have destroyed everything else. And Samuel's response was, why haven't you obeyed the Lord and done what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the plunder to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. All right, so this is the situation that we have before us. So we want to look at it from the perspective of leadership. So we want to look at the leadership role of each of these individuals, both of them are leaders on different levels, all right? But what role did they play and how did they handle the role, the responsibility that they were given, all right? So um, let's, let's talk about it, all right? So I don't know if you need to have the scripture up or not. Um, for you to talk from the scripture. Okay, you can let me know if you prefer for me to take it down or if you don't need it, that's fine as well. Okay, so so what, what are your thoughts here in terms of leadership? Um, let's start with Samuel. 
um, what kind of leader was Samuel as in terms of what we see here? Well, let's let's start off with what was Samuel's role as as a prophet, as a prophet of God. What was Samuel's role? Was he to tell Saul what the Lord wanted him to do? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. He, he he as a prophet of God, he declares, "Thus said the Lord." Now, did Samuel um carry out that function? Did he? He went to Saul and he told him what God wanted him to do. He, he went. He went to Saul and told him exactly, exactly what it is that God told Samuel. Samuel told Saul. Good, good stuff. So he is handling his role appropriately as God had dictated. As a leader. As yeah. a leader. As a leader. Yep. As a leader. So he is now in the, in the role of prophet, even though he's also a priest and a judge. In this scenario, he is operating in the leadership role of prophet. All right. So good. So what about Saul now? In this scenario, um, what is Saul's position? What is his um, title? Okay. What is what is Saul's um, positional uh, role? What's his title in this particular case? He was a king. Okay, he was the king. So he was the <laughs> king of Israel. And so, um, because now the kings were the ones now, instead of the judges, the kings were the ones who would go out and have to fight, um, you know, as necessary. And in this case, um, it was God who told them to go out and initiate this battle um, against the Amalekites. And we know why. Okay. So how did Saul carry out his role? Did he have it appropriately or inappropriately? Inappropriately. Inappropriately. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, a num a number of things that he did inappropriately. So what what was one of those things that that Saul did that was inappropriate according to what Samuel uh, uh, told him to do? He spared the king of the, what do you call them, Amalites? Amal Amalekites, yep. Mm -hmm. Which he wasn't supposed to do. And he kept the best sheep and cattle, which he wasn't supposed to do. Mm -hmm. My, Go ahead. I said, it seems like he thought, well, you know, we're going to make this, uh, we're going to give this to your God. We're going to sacrifice it for your God. So what's the problem? The problem mm -hmm. is you didn't do what God told you to do. Mm -hmm. He told you to destroy the entire Amalekite nation. Mm -hmm. Women, children, everything, and the animals. Well, if he saved the cattle, the best sheep of cattle, he, dis he disobeyed. If mm -hmm. he saved the king, he disobeyed. So he didn't follow what he was told to do. He okay. did what mm -hmm. he did not follow what he was told to do. But what was his attitude when when Samuel came? Because God sent God sent Samuel. <laughs> God sent Samuel after him. So when Samuel got there, what was Saul's uh, whole attitude? What, what was his attitude? Saul, Saul was basically working for himself and his own beliefs because a key to that was he kept saying, your God, your Lord, I mean, your God. Mm -hmm. So he really wasn't go abiding by what the rule for them were really to be. 
but he was doing just enough he thought to get by to satisfy oh. Samuel. Ooh. So um you know it was like he was a leader and also Samuel but he was to follow what Samuel told him to do and he didn't. Mm -hmm. So there was. Mm -hmm. so he did. Okay, I I like that. I I like that comment. Um he was doing just enough to get by, to squeak mm -hmm. by. Mm -hmm. um, God says, wipe everybody out. You say, well, yeah, I wipe everybody out. I want the king. I want to spare the king. Just that's not no big deal. Big deal. Um, kill all the animals. Kill the animals, but you know, hey, you know, we can sacrifice some of these to to the Lord. Okay. So, so as, as a leader <laughs> doing just enough to get by, just enough to get by, how does that work? Just enough to get by, to say, well, yeah, I, I, I carried out the instructions. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, I did what pastor said. Yeah, I, I I I I followed the Lord. Yeah, the Lord told me to do this. I I I did it. Well, did we really do what the instructions were that we were given? See, as, as a leader, remember, as a leader, we are to set the example. We are to set the example. So, doing just enough to get by, to squeak on by. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It's not 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 good enough. It's not good enough for God. <laughs> it's not good enough for um, the kingdom of God, for what it is that God wants us to do, would have us to do. It's not sufficient. Okay. And then um, the comment was also made in terms of how in, in, in speaking to Samuel, how he referred to to Samuel, or I should say, refer to the Lord. He refers to the Lord as your God, as Samuel's God. Yes, I did obey the Lord, your God. What, 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 what does that indicate to you? What does that say? The Lord, your God. He wasn't accepting of the Lord. And his, his reign over all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, he's over you. He's your God, but mm, uh -huh. he, he ain't really my God. my God. And if he ain't really my God, then do I really have to listen right. to him? Right. You know, so does it really matter it doesn't really matter what I do because he's your God. He ain't really my God. So Saul is not claiming the Lord as his God. He is simply saying, that's your God, Samuel. That's your God. And 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 he repeats it. So you know that this is something that uh that that is deep in his heart. Um so he does not claim God and the authority that God has over him him and so your attitude your attitude as a leader is so important he can't tell me what to do who he think he is he can't tell me what to do okay um we saw again the example with Barnabas and and Paul where Barnabas um initially Barnabas was in charge over Paul and then the Lord changed it after a year then the Lord said, nope, now, Paul, you are over Barnabas. And Barnabas submitted, no problem, no issues, to follow the instructions of the Lord. Your attitude is critical. Your attitude is critical. You know, someone, you know, gives an instruction or whatever. I ain't got to do that. I ain't got to do that. Or, again, whatever or do just enough to get by okay again as leaders we are building the kingdom of god 
and where he has placed us is at Rise Community Church. <laughs> and so we are building God's kingdom at Rise Community Church. And so whatever instruction God gives to us, that's what we are supposed to be doing as leaders. And remember, we said that leaders, you can have the title of leader, um, that formal title of leader, but you can also be, even without a title, informal leaders because people are watching you. Leadership is influence. And if you have influence over others, then you are still having a leadership role. All right. So the Lord, your God, his attitude, that's not my God, doing just enough to get by. But then we see another thing here with, with Saul. Um, look at, okay, look at, look at verse 15. Look at what it says in verse 15. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, but they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God. We have destroyed everything else. So what is it that this leader, the king, um, what is he saying when Samuel says, look, you said you carried out the Lord's command and killed everything, but I hear the bleeding of the sheep. What's going on? And what does Saul's response say about Saul as a leader? What, what is he doing with this response? when he says that the army spared the best of the sheep. The army spared the best of the sheep that, and they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord. Who is he stating is at fault. According to Saul, who is the one at fault in this scenario, according to Saul? The army. Mm -hmm. The army, the soldiers, he is saying, they're the ones that don't, don't look at me. Don't, don't, don't look at me. It's, it's, it's the people. It's mm -hmm. the people. Yeah. They're the ones who spared the best of the sheep. And they're the ones that said they, they, they did it to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. But we, we, now he put himself in, we have destroyed everything else. Okay. So, so Saul is, as the leader, he is refusing to accept responsibility and instead of accepting responsibility he tries to blame the people the soldiers sounds like adam and eve <laughs> right it's the woman you gave me why i ate and then the woman says well, it's the serpent's fault, okay? So as a leader, the bug stops with you. The, the bug stops with you. Blaming um, other people, blaming someone else. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Nope, nope, nope. You are responsible. Saul as king was responsible. Even if the people said, this is what we want to do, he's king. His word is law. He was the one who was to say, no, that's not what God said. Kill everything. Kill the king, kill all the animals, kill everything. Because the word of the Lord says we are to destroy everything completely. But the problem is that it was the king. It was Saul himself who was responsible and whose heart wasn't right. And we know that his heart, his attitude as the leader wasn't right because when 
when uh, Samuel came, he greeted him cheerfully. Mm, I have carried out the Lord's command. I, see there he says, I have carried out the Lord's command. But then when Samuel now confronts him with no, you did not, he says, oh, it's the people. That's because of the people. I did. I destroyed everything. But the people did, did this. So as a leader, mm -mm, nope, 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 nope. The buck stops with you. <laughs> the buck stops with you as a leader. Pastor says, you know, I need you to uh, make sure X, Y, or Z happens. I would like you to take charge of this activity or whatever it is. Okay. He has given you that responsibility. The buck stops with you to get it done. Okay. When the Lord gives pastor instructions, guess who God is going to come to? God is going to come to the pastor. He ain't going to the people. He gave pastor instruction. I need X, Y, Z done. That's the one who is responsible. Pastor, ask it. I need you to do X, Y, O, Z. That's who is responsible. And so as leaders, as leaders, we want to make sure that our attitude is right. Because that was the problem with Sal. It was his attitude that was wrong. And his attitude is what led him to um, disobey God and not just disobey, but disobey and feel that it was okay, that it was all good. And then confronted, refusing to accept um, responsibility, doing just enough, bare enough to feel that I can say I have obeyed the Lord's command when indeed he did not. And he knew he did not. So what was the results of his actions? The result of Saul's um, poor leadership, if you want to say it that way, um, we see the results here in 22 because God told Samuel to let Saul know. Okay, verse 22, um, Samuel says to Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey God and do what God says to do is better than this lame excuse that you are saying, well, we wanted to sacrifice to the Lord, okay? Because remember, sacrifice meant worship, okay? In, in, in under the old covenant, the way in which the worship was through sacrifice. And so basically what they were trying to say, what Saul was trying to say, the excuse he was trying to say is, we disobeyed God so that we could worship God. Hmm. Let, 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 let me say that again. Saul's excuse was we disobeyed God and didn't kill everything so that we could use those things that God had said to destroy to worship God. And Samuel, God's mouthpiece says, mm -mm, doesn't work, doesn't work. To obey is better than sacrifice. And then, but he wasn't done with his message from the Lord. Then he told Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the command of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you as king. The Lord has rejected you as king. You rejected the Lord. His heart wasn't right. See, man may look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart and God judges the heart. And his heart was not right. 
And we know his heart wasn't right because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He could not own God as his God, but as the Lord Samuel's God. And he did just barely enough that he figured he could use to squeak by. His attitude was wrong and he refused to accept responsibility. And because of this, God rejected him as king over Israel. And it was shortly after this that God told Samuel to go and anoint David as the next king of Israel. And of course, we know the sad saga that went on with Saul where he chased David for years and years and years, trying to kill him to prevent him from becoming king. But you cannot stop what God says. If God says it, then you can't change it. You cannot change what God has decreed. And so Saul was killed in battle, and both, both Saul and Jonathan, Saul's son, and then David was crowned as king over Israel. And so uh, Saul lost out of his position. He lost his place. He lost the favor. And not only, listen, listen, not only for himself, but he also lost it for his son, Jonathan. Jonathan, he says, your descendants will not remain as king. I have sought for someone better than you and that was the person of David, who Samuel then anointed as the second king of Israel. So these are some of the um, leadership lessons that we learn from uh, this particular story. And so we just want to be cognizant of these lessons and not just have it as something you know, in the scripture that happened, you know, 3,000 years ago, but to really take these lessons and apply them to our lives, to ourselves, so that we can see that getting by, squeaking by isn't enough, isn't good enough. God won't accept it. Having a bad attitude, a wrong attitude, mm -mm, that's not going to work. Refusing to accept responsibility, mm -mm, none of that is going to cut it. And we see the exact opposite in Samuel, where Samuel did exactly what God had told him to do. All right. Um, okay, so we will pause there and see if there's any more comments, questions, any um, insights that um, you may have uh, from this uh, story, looking at the leadership of these two men, Samuel being the prophet, a priest, and a judge, and then Saul being the first king of Israel and how they manage their roles and the results of it. Okay, I don't see any hands or if you wanted to, um, Pastor. Dr. Dr. Jenner, uh, I want to thank you for a very powerful lesson. And I just love um, how you weave the scripture and how you make it relevant. Uh, your, your last few comments, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Your last few comments I take as a particular kind of warning. Uh, they said that uh, the former president was indicted today or something. Uh, yeah, he was found, found guilty, yes. Found guilty, okay. Uh, I take that as a warning because for all leaders, because in that moment, I think there's a moment before the moment. And I think 
with Saul, and maybe this is a question for you, what you think about this. He got the ultimate moment wrong because all along he had cheated the process of his faith development and spiritual maturity. So when the big matter came, he, he failed to meet the challenge of the moment. Mm -hmm. So he blames. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying or what I hear the spirit saying through you today is unlike Samuel, Samuel does not, is, he's what they call practicing the presence of God. Yes. It's only when you practice somebody's presence that you hang with somebody that you hear their voice. And the more you hear their voice, the more they trust you. So faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. In the field of medicine, they say that when somebody loses their appetite, that's when they know they're sick. But when they, but, but as long as they their appetite for food, they're sick. But then when they begin to gain the appetite, they know that health is coming back. Mm -hmm. Same thing with God. One of the ways we know that a person is healthy, a family is healthy, a congregation is healthy, is connected to their appetite for God. Mm -hmm. Once they begin to lose their appetite or it wanes, then their righteousness, their grace, their power, in God wanes, they lose health. But when they begin to regain it, Samuel, David, then that's that's why they're able to stand when the moment comes, the trouble comes, they're able to make the right choice. All I'm trying to suggest is the choice is made before the moment. The moment really expresses or manifests what you were doing all along. Exactly. Exactly. Go right ahead, mm -hmm. Put your e yes, exactly. So, um, basically, there there is the growth that is is needed. You 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 grow as an individual. You grow as a believer. You grow uh, as a leader. But for growth to take place. There are certain things that you need to do. You need to be. You need to be in the word. You need to be submissive. You need to be humble, to be able to receive the instruction that's needed, so that you can be discipled, so that you can grow. To spend time in the presence of God, that consecrated hour, that practicing the habit of the Spirit, to spend time nurturing that relationship with God, so that when the 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 situation arises then there's really no no question and you're able to pass the test of the situation the problem with Saul was that Saul was not there Saul had not grown in 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 and nurtured a relationship with God so he was satisfied with just doing mediocre, satisfied with disobeying, satisfied with blaming and shifting the blame to other people. He was quite satisfied and comfortable doing that. So we as leaders, that's the lesson we need to take away. Nurturing that relationship with God is key to the growth and the development as individuals and as a church so that so that we can become all that God has destined for us to become see Saul did not become all that God had destined for him to become because he refused to do what was necessary and so instead of that he was cut off literally cut off he refused to kill King Agag and God says well guess what Ultimately, you are going to be killed. You are going to be killed by the enemy. And that's exactly what happened to him. But not only to him, it went on to the next generation, to his son, Jonathan. So what we do doesn't only affect us. It affects others as well.
And that's why it is so important to maintain that relationship, that intimacy with God, because then when we are faced with a situation that we need to handle, then we are able to do it according to the word of God, according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then we will be able to receive the benefit, the blessings of what God intends for us to receive. And we can have the blessing of seeing God's kingdom to grow. Amen. Amen. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Praise the Lord. All right, all right. Well, I am just so um so delighted that again that you took the time out to um um for this time in the word. It's important and it is part of the growing process. All right. So you are doing what it is you're supposed to be doing, what you need to do in order to grow. So I commend each and every one of you. And so um, if we don't have any, you know, further comments or uh, questions, um, then we can um, close out our time together tonight. All right. Um, so, um, Sandra, could you um, pray for us and close us out, please? Yes, ma'am. Father God, we thank you so much for this lesson. You're putting it out there, letting us know that if you disobey, there are consequences. Mm -hmm. Very clear what you wanted Saul to do. And he purposely disobeyed you because he didn't see you as his God. But we see you as our God. Mm. Well, for that relationship, Lord. Yes. For being in the midst of this lesson today and reminding us when you tell us something to do, we should obey you. You say that in your word and you make it very clear. Thank you, Father, for this gathering. Thank you for each person that was a part of the gathering, for all of the input. And just we just thank you and are grateful for all that you do for us, Father. We thank you for Dr. Dennery. We thank you for Pastor Adela Khan and their families, Lord. And so we come before you in all humbleness. Mm -hmm. Because we know that you are the leader. You are the one who has our best interest at mm -hmm. heart. We thank you for every opportunity you give us to glorify and magnify your name. And so it is in Jesus' name that we pray and ask it all. Thank you again for God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Praise God, everybody. Amen. Yes, Amen. praise God. Amen. Amen. I, I just want to say this is our crowning Bible study, uh, Tuesday Bible study, before we go into year two. So on Sunday, we go into year two, Dr. Dennery. So you've helped us to celebrate one year in Bible study yeah. as we are a growing church, a vigorous church, a vital church. We are practicing the presence of God, and we certainly know that obedience is better than sacrifice. So this is an outstanding way to uh, crown the year and to, and to plant the seed, lay the proper biblical foundation, yes. a house built on rock, not on sand. Yes. Well, Paul, the Bible says, watch how you build. Yes. And so we are so glad that the Lord sent, uh, Paul said, I build as a master builder, but on no other foundation can you lay except Christ. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts at Rise for, uh, for, for being such a central part of a year of challenges. Yes, thank you. But without a challenge, you can't have a championship. Mm. And so we give God praise of the yeah. obedience. Oh, my God. Amen. Amen. And that we believe that we are salt and light. We did not know we would see this day. There were some days that came and we did not know. But the Bible says, do, do, not, do, do not look to your left or to your right. And thank you that you did not 
you helped us focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. You helped us be, be rise. You helped us with the resurrection power. You taught Amen. the word, but the spirit taught you the word to teach us. Praise Thank God. you on behalf yes. of rise. Thank we are excited you. to go into year two. We are humbled. As Sister Thurman prayed yesterday, Lord, we are humbled that you would even think that we could be part of this number, part of the fellowship, to grow as disciples. Oh, give God praise. Thank you. Because Amen. the Bible says that we ought to uh, 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 honor those in leadership, especially those that labor in the word. They deserve double honor. Thank you. And thank you, church, for being so faithful and, and, and fruitful in your dedication to prayer, Bible, and stewardship. Yes. yes. Nobody yes. can steal my joy. Nobody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man. So the joy of the Lord is our strength. I say thank you, my sister. Thank you. Every member on this call, thank you. Even for those that are, thank you. God has done a miracle. It says confirming the word with signs. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank oh you so much. Amen. I, it is my joy. It is my joy to serve um, just ev every time. Just the opportunity to serve is for me a blessing. So so thank we you as well you for allowing me uh, to be a part of the Rice family. <laughs> we love you. love you so much. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you. you. You're so welcome. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. All right. Good night. Thank good you. Good evening, everyone. God bless you all. God bless. Amen. And God bless you.